Friday night, we have a special family night at 6 o'clock. And we're going to watch a movie called Mom's Night Out. I heard it's hilarious. It's cool. It's funny. Um, kind of a neat uh, event for kickoff your Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and we need, need you to sign up on the information sheet uh, so we can have enough food for everybody. It will be a fun time for you to come and join us together for a family a time of sharing together. Let's open our Bibles to Judges chapter 13. Judges 13. And let's stand as we honor God's word this morning. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. There was a certain man of Zorah, the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink. And eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. For no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God. From the womb he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. And I didn't ask, did not ask him where he was from. And he did not tell me his name, but said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then, drink no wine or strong drink. Eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to this day, to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we are to do with this child who will be born. And the Lord listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field that Manoah was not with her, uh, was not with her. So the woman ran, woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man of God came to me, the came to me the other day, appeared to me. And Manoah rose and went with after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man? spoke to this woman, and he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be a child's manner of life? And what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all the things that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine. Neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that it was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the goat, young goat with the grain offering and offered it on a rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame and the altar, the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching and they fell on their faces to the ground. And the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew, his, knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, Surely, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord meant to kill us, would he, have not, he would not have accepted a burnt offering of grain at our hands, or shown us all these things now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and she named him Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir upon him at Mahana Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. Thank you, maybe see you. Well, this morning, graduates, I have a graduation address for you. 
you. It is one you will probably not hear in one of your school graduations. Uh, at school graduations, often the theme is uh, you have the potential to achieve your dreams and be successful in this world. Here's how you do it, right? Everybody wants you to go out and be a success. Well, this morning, uh, I firmly believe that if you seriously consider the words of God to you this morning, you will become a spiritual success. And when you become a spiritual success, everything else will take care of itself. Because at the foundation of life are the principles of God's word that are extremely important, things we need to listen to. And we have a, a very interesting account, one of the great stories of the Bible, one you probably potentially learned or heard about when you were uh, a child, the story of Samson, God's great superhero, right? Um, Samson had a tremendous amount of strength, that's what we remember him for. But as we look at his life, as it unfolds in the book of Judges, chapter 13 through 16, we learn that uh, Samson had a very unique birth. His mother uh, attempted, uh, and his father attempted together to conceive children and never took place. She was a barren woman, very much discouraged, uh, distraught in life. Uh, coming to grips with the fact that she'd never have a child, when all of a sudden the angel of the Lord appears to the wife of Manoah, saying, you're going to have a child. This is going to be any ordinary child. This child has a mission, a mission to accomplish, to begin a work of destroying the enemy of Israel, the Philistine. He has a, a very special mission, and for in order for him to accomplish it, these important things have to take place. You have to be very careful what you eat and drink, what you touch, and most of all, when the child begins to grow, you can't cut his hair. So we see Samson, very before his birth, was anointed and appointed by God, had a life ahead of him that was full of promise, full of potential, full of great things, just like every person in this room today. God has blessed you with the light. It's a life that he's imparted abilities, skills, resources. Everyone has potential to accomplish important things for God's glory in life. Right? All of us do. We go to that verse in Jeremiah where it says, For I know I have the plans for you, plans for you to prosper, plans for you to succeed. God has those kinds of plans for every one of us. And we see that specifically in the, the life of Samson. Anointed by God, appointed by God, destined for success. To be a leader. To be a man who would stand up for, for, for what was right and to lead his people in the defeat of his enemies. What a life. Right at its outset. What excitement for his parents. And certainly I love that statement by his father before he's born. He goes to the angel of the Lord, who he doesn't really know. He's a little bit freaked out because this is an angel and uh, speaking to him. And he says, I want to know very clear, carefully how I can raise this child so he will, he will reach his potential. Teach me. The parent had a very teachable spirit. I don't want my child in any way to be hindered from achieving the greatness that God has for him. That's quite an attitude for a parent to take. And so we know that Samson is anointed by God and appointed God. We know that there's great things in store for his future. Well, let's go to the end of Samson's life. Let's see how it, how it all turned out. And, and I was thinking about this. I'm, I'm somewhere, pretty well close, in a couple years, to be 40 years out of high school. <laughs> kind of scary, isn't it? I've never been to one class reunion. Because the day I left high school is the day I left California and basically never went back. And it would be interesting to see what my classmates are looking like and doing in their lives today, 40 years down the road. 
How is life sort of sledded for you, right? Think about your classmates' graduates. Lots of promise, lots of potential. Where do you think, knowing the way they're headed, the where you're going, where do you think you'll be in 40 years? I'm sure you have an assignment like that in class, right? Where do you think you'll be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Well, with Samson's life, we can tell where he was in the future years of his life. We go to the end of his life and we, we see what happened to this child who, who was anointed by God, who was appointed by God, who had a destiny with success, be the leader over his people. And the Bible tells us that Samson is blind. The Bible tells us his eyes were gouged out by the Philistines, the people that God intended for Samson to conquer. To defeat. At the end of his life, he's a slave. He has no freedom. He's bound in chains. And he is mocked. He's oppressed. He is made sport of. He's a joke to the Philistines. Not quite the picture of success, is it? Not an image of greatness. Not what you might expect to see from the life of someone who, who showed so much promise at the beginning, at the outset. He's in no way the, the person that God intended it to be, and he's not experiencing the promising life that we see mentioned at the beginning of his life. But I want you to see that God accomplished some of the things, or the things that he wanted to, through the life of Samson, he did destroy the Philistines. The problem is, Samson himself, because of the choices that he made in life, lived a very frustrated, complicated, and trying life. He lived a very frustrated, tried, complicated life. So you got to ask the question, how come? Why did this happen? Why did such a life with so much promise end up to be such a frustrated, tried, trying, complicated, unfulfilled life at the end? How did a person start out being anointed by God and appointed by God, a person with so much potential come to the end of his life, a slave. Not a leader. Why did he end up in this pitiful condition? The same question has been asked a lot of times in life about many people who, who started this life with a lot of promise who benefited from a spiritual foundation in life, who, who really had solid family roots and went on their way uh, and walked away from God to indulge in the pleasures of sin and to put themselves in bondage to their flesh, the world, and the devil. And as we investigate the details of Sam and Samson's life, we discover there was one factor more than any one that led to his demise. That took a man of great promise and took his life in a direction downward. So that when he ended his life, it was so much less than what it could have been. And it was simple. This one thing is the key to God's blessing. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, graduates, this is the key to spiritual success. We will succeed spiritually when we maintain in our lives a teachable spirit before God. You get that? A teachable spirit before God. When we allow God to have a place in our life where He can instruct us, He can guide us, He can, he, we can receive from Him the wisdom and counsel of His Word. That's where Samson went all wrong.
There's four things in Samson's life that demonstrate he wasn't teachable, but we're going to flip those around. Because we want to we want to give you the positive aspect of what is a teachable spirit? How does it look? The first thing is a teachable spirit leans on God's understanding and not their own. A teachable spirit leans and trusts on God's understanding and not their own. They look to God, they wait on God, they seek out God's direction for their life. They want to be so led by God because they realize God's blessing is so much worth it and joy in life comes from that and so they, they, they crave that. And sadly, this is not where Samson directed his life. And sadly, this is where many lives sort of waver from the path. Because we lead and operate our lives from our own understanding, from our own wisdom and counsel rather than God's. There were three indicators or signs that show a person is really leaning on God's understanding and not their own. The first one is they're willing to obey the clear teaching of Scripture. Here's how you know you're not leaning on your own understanding, you're leaning on God's. You're willing to receive counsel and instruction from God's Word, and you're willing to do it. Now, in Samson's life, we see this was an evidence how he failed to do this. When it came to his, first of all, it shares with us in chapter 14, his decision for a life partner, his wife. Interesting. Samson had a choice. A lot of, lot of people in the field probably he could have chosen from. But you notice in chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah to get a wife. And at first glance, not a problem. He went to Timnah, he found a woman, parents have to arrange the marriage, so he comes back to his mom and dad, saying, Mom and Dad, I found this cute little gal down at Timnah, can we arrange for this marriage? And his parents' first response is, oh, no. Samson, um, would you consider somebody else? Um, Samson, we don't think this is going to be a good idea for you to get your wife from Timnah. And you go, why? What's the big deal with Timnah? Timnah is in the land of the Philistine. Timnah is the land of people who are opposed to the God of Israel and to the Israelite. Timnah is a culture that is certainly uh, marked by its idolatry, its, its aversion to spiritual life. And the commandments and covenant that God made with Israel. So Samson's going to the enemy. He's going to the world. He's going to someone who is not on the same spiritual plane as his own life. And I said, and he says to his parents, bring her to me. Get her for me. I want her. I will accept no one but her. Now Samson knew it. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 of the, the Old Testament law, that you shall not intermarry with them, it says. You shall not give your daughters or the, to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. That was the clear teaching of God's word. And Samson says, I don't care. She's cute. She's pretty. I want her! Go get her! Now you have to know, Samson was getting pretty buff by now. Not like his dad, Manoah, getting up in years, could say, Look, dude, I'm not doing this for you, son. So his, his parents can see to his request. By doing so, Samson idol linked himself, yoked himself to an idolatrous woman who would lead him away from God rather than, than help him remain in connection with God. And we find in life a teachable spirit will listen to the Word of God.
It will heed what God says. It will treasure what God says. That's why David said, How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against God, against thee. David learned, if you want to keep your way pure and right, you heed God's word. You hide it in your heart. You crave that because it's going to keep you on the right path. It's going to keep you from making poor decisions that complicate life. Teachable spirit listens to God. It wants God's direction. Secondly, a teachable spirit that demonstrates it's not leaning on its own understanding. It, it, it's, it really is willing to listen to wise counsel. Samson's parents wisely counseled him against this, and he said, I don't want any of this. Young people seek out wise counsel. People that are walking with God. There's so much to learn. There's so much that you can avoid in heartache, in complication, in struggle, in disappointment in life when you're willing to humble yourself and seek out wise counsel from others. And thirdly, in this passage we notice Samson really struggled to give credit to God for the things that God was doing in his life. And a teachable spirit that leads on God and his understanding more than their own is willing to acknowledge God for the things that God does. We see that in the life of Samson. So a teachable spirit is willing to seek out God's counsel, willing to lean on his own under his understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean in all of Lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Second thing, a, a teachable spirit learns from their mistakes. Just because you're in possession of a teachable spirit doesn't always mean you're not going to err or you're not going to struggle because we are, there's a certain human element to life is that not, and we don't always do the right thing all the time. But a teachable spirit learns from their mistakes, from their sins, from their errors. Throughout Samson's life, we find out that he is constantly being deceived by women. Samson was strong. He could tear things up. He slew the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. But when he was in the presence of a woman that he thought was attractive, he melted like butter. He wasn't all that powerful. He could very much be influenced when he was in the presence of a beautiful woman. First it was his fiance who later became his wife. Then it was a prostitute who got him in all kinds of trouble and then finally the ultimate, the creme de la creme, the most beautiful woman he ever laid his eyes on, Delilah. their judgment. 
Proverbs 10, verse 17 says, He who heeds discipline shows the way of life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Whoever ignores correction leads others astray. The author, Portia Nelson, wrote his autobiography. Very interesting autobiography about his life. And it's five chapters. And I read the autobiography, and I want to share it with you. Five chapters. They're very short. Chapter one. Here, here's the time. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fell in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It takes forever to find my way out. Chapter two. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in. I can't believe I'm in the same place again. It's not my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It's my fault. And I get out. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down a different street. I walk down. Spiritually successful people learn from their mistakes. Unteachable people do not. Number three, a teachable spirit will lead instead of react. You know, Samson, he's always reacting. If you read through the text, he's always reacting to stuff. A lot of times in anger, things happen, he gets mad and he reacts. He's right. He's not leading. He, he's not leading the charge of the, of the Israelites. He's not gathering a group of people to say, Hey guys, I know I'm strong, but we can kick, we can kick out and take care of these nasty Philistines. Let's all rally together and do it. Samson isn't doing that. Samson is always reacting to the situations of life. Rather than setting the pace, rather than leading the way, Samson is reacting. He doesn't listen to God. He isn't directed by God's voice. Because of it, he's ineffective and he's frustrated in his efforts. He's very frustrated in his efforts. And Christians today, God has called us to set the pace. To, to live to a higher standard. Yet many crumble when it's time to lead. In the face of their peers, they crumble when it's time to be and to stand up for God and to stand up for His work and to stand up for truth and to stand up for righteousness. Oh no, I'm just going to sort of fit in because it's an easier ride. And then we find out all throughout life, we're just reacting, just reacting instead of leading out of convictions that are deep in our heart on a God we love and a God we trust, knowing that His word is firm. And stands true forever. And finally we see in this passage. That a teachable spirit. Resists the lure of temptation. By not yielding to it. Resists the lure of temptation. By not yielding to it. In Samson's experience with the Delilah. It's so interesting. How he continually puts himself in a vulnerable position. It's almost like he knows what this woman is after. She wants to know the secret of my strength. How many times does she ask? And at first it's kind of just a game. He's kind of messing with her, he thinks. But somehow blinded by his pride and his lust, he continued to put himself in this tempting situation. Again and again, and eventually he gave in. And 
led to his ultimate downfall in life. And in the end, Samson was humiliated. He was destroyed. And folks, the power of Samson wasn't his hair. Do you know that? The hair was just the last of the three things. Remember God said should never happen, right? God said, I'll bless this kid if he does three things. And it's quite interesting. God in his mercy let Samson fail at two of those. And he still maintained his strength. He still had potential to turn his life around. He, he went into a vineyard and made contact with grace, which he wasn't supposed to. He touched, remember, the dead lion that he killed? Because bees had got it, or there were bees in the, in the, in the, the belly of this lion. And, and it was a dead animal, and he wasn't supposed to touch it. But you know what, Samson, he was hungry, he was famished, he needed strength, and so he reached into the carcass of that, that lion and picked up, and he touched the dead lion. And he didn't even tell his parents that he did it. And he offered the honey to them, and he defiled his parents. And God was still patient, and God was still powerful in his life, because he still had his hair. He still was holy to the vow. But when he finally... Strike three, let go of the hair. It says, the Lord departed him. And then Samson found out how vulnerable he was when the Lord departed him. Notice what it says, with such an agony, Delilah plod, prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. This beautiful woman just nagged him and nagged him and nagged him and nagged him. And because he was so blinded by his lust, by his self-centeredness, he couldn't tell what was going on, that she was on the tape, that she was going to get paid for selling him out. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me. God would leave him because of his disobedience and he would become as weak as any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the Philistines, come back once more. He has told me everything, so the rulers of the Philistines returned with silver in their hands. And having put him into a deep, deep sleep on her lap, she called the men to shave the seven braids of his hair, and so began to subdue him. And then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and thought, he thought, I'll go out as before. I'll make short work of these clowns and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. People who continue to disregard the Word of God, the instruction and teaching of the Lord, who continue to walk in the counsel of the ungodly and stand in the way of sinners, will come to a point in their life where they will totally be unaware when God is speaking to them. And then the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes and took him down to God's as their pride, binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in a prison. What an end to a life that had so much problems early on. Folks, we need to be ready, for we never want to have the evil one come and deceive us and be swept away 
and to awaken someday to realize we've lost all the best that God had for us because we were careless and that we lacked a teachable spirit. Three things you have to know about sin. Sin will always take you farther than you intended to go. It will take you farther. You think, I'll go this far with sin, it will take you farther. It will keep you longer than you intended to stay. And it will cost you a lot more than you ever intended to pay. Can't you see Samson today? Before birth, he was anointed and appointed and blessed by God. And the end of life, instead of dying as a leader, as an exalted leader over his people, as a conquering champion, being the man of God, being the moral example to his people, setting the pace for others. Samson is grimacing at a mill. He's blinded and he's bound and he's defeated and he's not experiencing God's best in his life. It's because he lacked a teachable spirit. Thirty years from now, where will you be? Young people, what direction is the course you are taking of life? Where, where are you headed? Do you possess a teachable spirit? Are you open to receive from God His counsel and direction? This may be the last time or one of the few last moments you'll ever hear this kind of instruction to you. And you're at that point in life at a crossroads, a defining moment for you as you walk off the platform with that diploma in hand and take on a new and exciting but potentially scary because it's not the same as high school. A lot more weight on decisions and choices, a lot more temptations and pressures when you get out into the world of college, a lot more teachers and people trying to instruct you that everything you learned in, in, as a child in your, in your church about God is a bunch of hogwash. It's a bunch of rubbish. Don't kid yourself. I sat here on, on, on Friday talking to a college student after his first year in college, and he was sharing with me some of the things they were teaching him. And he was just... He was just like, I can't believe they're saying this. I said, yeah, they're saying a lot of stuff like that. And I'm so thankful he had the wisdom and discernment to know that what they were saying was not the truth. But I've heard parents come to me and say, yeah, the kid went off to college and they, they took God out of his life. They completely brainwashed him. To the, to the nonsense and the foolishness of the wisdom of man. Where are you headed? God has many things, good things to show you in your life. But the question is, will we experience them? Will we experience them? And is it today to say, surrender my life? To what God wants me to do. Maybe you're, maybe you're older. Maybe you plowed this tough life, this complicated life, because you were that person, you were that, that proud young buck that said, I was going to kind of do it on my own. I didn't need God's counsel, and I didn't need this, and I, I could just do it on my own. And now you're starting to see life would have been so much better. Do you know there's grace and mercy with the Lord? And today is a new day, always with God. One of the most important decisions we can make, not only in having a teachable spirit, but a teachable spirit embraces Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That is the wisest thing that any person could ever do in life, to come to an end and say, I need Jesus. I need Him to be my partner in life, and I'm willing to go with Him today. And as we bow and as we close this service, as you think about the challenges that have been laid before you, will you, will you determine to say, I'm going to go in a, in a direction where I possess a teachable spirit and experience God's blessing. Will you humble yourself and surrender to the Lord today as we just bow our heads and think for a moment and as, as you have a concern or need or something you'd like to pray about or today you want to make a stand to say, 
God, I, I want to have that teachable spirit as I walk 